In the last video I found the 8 gauge battery to fender cable has some interesting cousins. But before continuing, please remember I'm covering this from the perspective of electron flow. The motor to firewall and frame to floor bonding cables do more than their name implies. And they are bi-directional, pulling electrons from the body tub grounding plane to the motor during glow plug warm up and starter engagement then reversing after the alternator takes over supplying electrical power. Functionally we have parallel circuits and since wires and cables have resistance we can use equations to determine overall resistance. When you have resistors in parallel they combine to a lower resistance, a larger size cable. And in this case the one 8 gauge and two 12 gauge cables calculate to the equivalent of a 4 gauge cable just the same as the 6 liter positive cable, the situation I was initially worried about. But nothing is that simple because we also have connections, and with connections it becomes a series parallel calculation. All connections have resistance, and if there is corrosion or poor contact, the benefit of a parallel circuit can easily be lost, because resistance in series is summed together. Going back to modifying the layout to improve my truck's voltage readings, which was the initial goal. I mentioned in the earlier video that when I found the lower bonding cable burned, I replaced it with two 8 gauge cables. Essentially a 4 gauge cable due to parallel 8 gauge cables. So I need to see what I caused by doing that. Wait to start. Starting and running. The directional flow characteristics of current are still the same. During starter engagement, there's more flow from the body tub to the frame rail. That's coming from the passenger 8 gauge cable to the fender, which is showing only a little increase. That's an instrumentation limitation, as I'll show later. Once the engine is running and the alternator is supplying power, the passenger 8 gauge cable is no longer the dominant flow path. The 4 gauge frame to floor cable is. The frame is a much better pathway than from the block connection to the battery and then across the 8 gauge cable to the fender. The driver's battery is not involved as the negative side is dead ended at the battery. But keep in mind there's more of a demand at the 8 gauge cable for amps, which drops voltage. Not what I want to do. So the frame to floor cable goes back to stock. Pulling up a Google search for negative cables on a 6O brings up a slew of negative cable additions to the alternator. It's the presumption that 3 alternator mounting bolts to the intake manifold 16 bolts between the manifold and the heads, and 30 head bolts are not good parallel circuits. And a one aught cable from the block to the passenger battery is insufficient. I'll go along with this idea about the 8 gauge cable. But the situation is this. It's a fourth parallel cable in addition to the two bonding cables and the 8 gauge battery cable. And parallel circuits are big on sharing no matter the size of one. The typical routine is to add a cable from the alternator to the fender, running against the firewall so the cable is about 54 inches. And it's typically a one aught cable for low resistance. I didn't have that, but I have a shorter 2 gauge cable, which actually has less resistance because it's a shorter length. Going long not only adds more cost, but you have to increase the size of the cable due to the longer length. Electronic engineers always go for a shorter distance when they can. The connection is typically the same, mounting to the commonly used fender bolt. It's a welded nut situation like the designated grounding points, but has a connection through a bracket. The bolt is self-threading like the grounding bolt, so it has good engagement. The video shows the meters mounted on the motor bonding cable, the added alternator cable, the 8 gauge battery cable, and the frame the floor bonding cable. Wait to start. <laughs> 
starting, running. To me it's interesting that with this cable layout, when the glow plugs are on, there's relatively no current flow through the 8 gauge cable. And the flow through the motor bonding cables and the added alternator defender cable is higher. The glow plugs are stalling the parallel flow through the 8 gauge cable somehow. The complexity of parallel circuits. And once the glow plugs are off, all four are in relative balance. Jumping to all electrical accessories on. When all of the electrical accessories are turned on, the dominant cables are the 8 gauge battery and the 12 gauge floor cable, not the added larger alternator cable. And when starting, even more current is flowed through the 8 gauge battery cable. In fact, the alternator cable has the lowest flow on my truck when all accessories are on. So the higher demand flow is surprising considering the cable sizes, but I need to look closely at the starting event. With this setup of an additional alternator negative cable to the fender, the overall direction of electron flow is the same as before. The sharing is different. And during engine running, while the glow plugs are on, it gets altered. During wait to start compared to the stock layout, the three cables, other than the battery 8 gauge cable, share the flow in concert to a slightly tighter band. During starter engagement, there is less flow through the firewall to block cable. The fender to alternator cable now shares this demand, but because of the less resistant pathway of three parallel cables instead of two bonding cables, the 8 gauge cable is flowing more negative current. This will cause more of a voltage drop in the 8 gauge cable, which feeds the PCM and FICM. Going back to my vehicle layout pictorial, the glow plugs are feeding. During starting, the glow plugs and starter combination demands more. Once the alternator is supplying negative current flow, there are directional changes. Now everything is going towards the ground plane and therefore the PCM and FICM grounding points. The problem for me is during the starting event, I want the ground plane or body to have the highest voltage to feed the PCM and FICM. Once it's running, it's fine. This could have been done with a shorter length and smaller gauge to the firewall connection for less money. It's possible there is a factor in the fender side connection which may hinder conductivity. But more of a pathway from the fender to the block during starting is not the direction I want to go. Alternatively, instead of this layout, going directly to the frame would provide a more direct path to the batteries using the frame ground plane, and one that would stress the 8 gauge cable less. If I installed this alternator cable directly to only one battery, it would upset the battery balance I was trying to achieve in my earlier work. Adding two would just get crazy compared to what should actually be done if we want better flow from the batteries to the starter. Another situation is the alternator's mounting bolts are not the best location for an additional cable. Every well-engineered alternator manufacturer provides an additional grounding point on the back case for the best flow. Even the 110 amp stock alternator has one. So pondering at the open hood of my truck, what am I trying to achieve? I'm trying to get electrons from this negative source to the PCM and FICM efficiently during initial key on and when the truck is running. Time to go a little X-Files. Most sources talk about the body tub as such a great grounding plane because when you calculate the thickness of the sheet metal by the width it has a lot of mass. But if you've done any body work that's not exactly right. You have spot welds from fender to firewall, and in the case of the FICM, fender to firewall to fender. So what if, 
They are a factor. Earlier, I was trying to get both batteries to contribute equally. This cost-effective layout does better than stock, but it's not perfect. At starting load, there's separation with a slow displaying meter. Ignore the plus and minus due to the connections, but there's a 0 0.182 volt difference. Yep, not much. Another instrumentation limitation. A continuously reading meter is designed with a slow display rate. It's just the way they are, and it's what I have. So I'm trying to get this current over here. But this terminal is not being used at all in this layout. So how about using it, and running a cable to the grounding screws themselves? If we look at the truck layout again, the battery flow cables to the body tub are these. The two main cables connect to the frame, which then leaves these as two parallel cables, battery negative to body. The frame to floor cable, however, changes direction depending on the demand at the engine block. Adding a cable from this battery terminal just adds a more direct path. And since the PCM and FICM grounds are still connected with the body tub, and therefore the passenger battery, there's no pathway that shouldn't be here. An edited video, but with the main readings. Wait to start. Starting. Running. Jumping to all electrical accessories on. And this current flow tends to balance out voltage equally between the batteries. I still have current going to the block for the starter demand, but the negative current flow from each battery is less than before, so the voltage drop in those cables is lessened. But during starter engagement, the floor to body 12 gauge cable does flow more towards the frame and therefore the block. During engine running, the current flow through the four parallel cables is well balanced. And when the vehicle is at full demand with all accessories on, the main cable is still a high flow path. So using the block diagram, I've gone from this to this when starting and this when running. Remember that shared or parallel circuits reduce resistance and therefore reduces voltage drop. Actually, because the main cable's in frame, it's more like this. So the FICM and PCM have a little easier pathway. Next is adding another 8 gauge cable from the driver's battery to another ground, the ABS grounding point by the driver's headlight. Wait to start. Starting. Running. All accessories. Relatively the same, but with the high load when all accessories are on, the balance is a little better. But it's a quirky little connection with varying balance depending on the load. This is probably due to the series bolting connections, despite the lower resistance of the shorter cable. 
The longer cable pathway has two connections to the FICM and PCM, while the shorter cable actually has three. Remember, connections can have a higher resistance than the cable itself, and with series connections, the resistance is summed. Start the X-Files music, unless the spot welds matter. So where am I at this point with my original goal of getting more consistent and a higher voltage supply to my harness, which feeds the PCM and FICM? If I compare the voltage reading off the batteries to the power port, I have about a 0.13 volt difference. When running after cold start, it shows about a 0.18 volts difference. Compared to SG2, about in between, 0.1 to 0.15 volts. FICM logic power shows 14 volts, but that only reads in 0.5 volt increments. So a 14.4 voltage will read 14.0 on that channel. And it's steady. After an early morning run, cool down, and restart, the voltage regulator has dropped the voltage output due to underhood heat, as it should. But the voltage differential between the channels is still good. This is months later. After a 40 mile run to the farm, voltages will drop a little more due to the underhood temperatures. That's what a good voltage regulator is supposed to do to protect the batteries from boiling out. But they are steady in voltage and the differential is within the PCM's normal display. A 13.8 will show as 13.5 on the logic reading. Maybe it's the exact same, maybe a few tenths off. Switching with all accessories on. Keep in mind this is the Lee Snevel 230 amp alternator, the honey badger of alternators. But any alternator of around 200 amps should keep enough headroom of amps over the demand to maintain voltage at idle. Yeah, I'm okay with this. But I'm not done investigating yet. I'm just ending this chapter even though I thought it would be the last. But the last cables are a good solution. Cheap and easy to make. I'll show all that next. Thanks for watching, and sorry for the delay in getting this out.